Greek historians like Xenophon and Tegeditis tell how military leaders before a battle would speak to the army and appeal to them to stand. What we meet in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians is a little like the same. Paul is appealing to the army of God to stand. Welcome to another tidbit from the Bible. I'm Dr. Paul Peterson. We are studying Ephesians and we have come to chapter 6 verse 10 to 20. Let's read from verse 10. Finally, the apostle says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The little word finally, or as some grammarians would say, in conclusion, is not only meant as a summary or a conclusion, a climax of the previous exhortations, which we find in chapter 4 and onwards, including the household codes in chapter 522 and onwards on the relationship between man and wife, parents and children, masters and slaves. No, this finally in verse 10 is opening for a climax or a conclusion of the whole of the epistles. And we will find that in the description of the army of God, you have a number of references to themes which have been mentioned previously in the epistle. We will look at these texts, this text on the armor of God, not only today, but also on the next tidbit. This time we will focus on the battle and the nature of the battle. And we will read through the text to get an overview. This is the last motivation before the final battle. Let's read on from verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, the one who is to put on the armor of God is the man of God, which previously in 2, 5 and 3, 6, 2.15 and 3.16 has been mentioned as the church of God. The church is that soldier that is asked to stand and the fight is against the schemes of the devil. Explained in verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This verse tells us about the nature of the battle. It's a spiritual battle. The Christians are not asked to take up literally swords and resist the Roman authorities, for instance. They are on the side of the crucified and risen Saviour who died rather than use force. But the text also makes us think back to what Paul has mentioned earlier, the heavenly places, the great controversy between good and evil. The heavenly places are mentioned many times. It is actually the, the aim of God, the very purpose of his plan of salvation to unite what is in heaven and earth, that is to overcome this temporary situation where sin is reigning. And we are, we have come to believe and we are therefore positioned with Christ in the heavenly places. We are represented by him, <coughs> sorry, in the heavenly sanctuary, our representative the high priest, Jesus Christ. The enemy, the devil, is mentioned as the prince of the power of the air in chapter 2, verse 2. So we have already previously several times mentioned this 
great controversy between good and evil and the position of Christ as the master over all has been firmly established in the, in the first chapter in verses 2, 20 to 22. Therefore, Paul continues in verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all that to stand firm. Now, verses 11 to 13 is like a, a mirror that is an reverted parallel called a chiasm. The first imperative, the first appeal is put on the whole armor of God. And the last is take up the whole armor of God. It is the same meaning. And in the middle you have this verse 12 with the fight against the evil powers of this world. Not the evil powers of human beings, but the evil in itself. Now, in the final description of the purpose to t for, for taking up this arm of God, you have what we would call eschatological overtones, that you may be able to withstand in the evil days. Day. Days, in plural, have already been mentioned, evil days, in 5.16. So Paul has in his vision also the final battle between good and evil. The last sentence, having done all that, you are to stand firm, leads us in to the next section, which follows from 14 to 16. Let's read the first appeal in verse 14. Stand therefore. To stand was and is a major necessity if you are to win a battle. And to stand is repeated several times in these verses, in this description of the army of God. So let's continue from verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The first imperative, stand therefore, is followed by a number of participles in Greek that is explaining or giving more detail, elaborating, on how you are going to stand. You have this armory, all these weapons. This is how you're going to stand in battle. Any citizen in the Roman Empire would recognize each of these elements of the army because he or she would be acquainted with Roman soldiers. They were everywhere. This was their standard equipment. But of course here, these elements of the equipment are used metaphorically to describe other values than those you have in a military battle. In verse 17, you have the last pieces of the armory. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And then you have an explanation. Which is the word of God. This is the final piece that's necessary. How should we understand it? Suddenly the Spirit is mentioned. The sword of the Spirit. It's not the sword with which the spirit fights as much as it is the sword that the spirit provides for the army. And that sword is the word of God. In the book of Revelation, the sword is seen as coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. The sword is the word of God provided by the Spirit 
inspired by the spirit, you could say. And then Paul moves into, you could say, the spiritual world more literally. In verse 18, he says, praying in at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. So from a metaphorical use of the physical weapons or armory, helmet and sword, Paul says, praying at all times. Now, to be honest, it is very likely that soldiers before they entered battle would pray. They still do. But this is a different kind of battle. Praying in the spirit should not be misunderstood as an expression. It does not mean that there is a particular method of praying which is particularly efficient in the spiritual battle. Praying in the spirit is not a specific method, but it means being led by, motivated by the spirit of Jesus. In Romans 8, Paul mentions how the spirit comes to our aid when we pray. And the whole point with the role of the spirit in the plan of salvation is Jesus is our representative in the heavenly sanctuary. He is our intercessor there, but the Holy Spirit comes to our aid so that when we pray, our prayers become more and more reflecting what Jesus wants us to do. So the Holy Spirit comes to our aid when we pray, helps us look at Jesus and helps us pray with his spirit unselfish, not for ourselves. And that is what we will see in the following sentence. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. The true praying in the Spirit indicates that we pray for others. We intercede for the saints. As Jesus intercedes for us, we intercede for each other. The Spirit helps us to pray, motivated by the love of Jesus, not for ourselves, but for others. And then Paul adds, and also for me, that the words may be given me to me in the opening of my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's remind ourselves of Paul's situation. He is a prisoner, he is in chains, and these chains is then a reminder to us of the battle that is going on. This battle for Paul is to present the gospel with clarity in a world of hostility, in a world of devilish attacks. So the prayers motivated by the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, is not prayers for material success or progress. It is prayers and praying for others and for the victory of the gospel, the victory of the word of God, because the Christian army does not use swords, but the word of God in Christ. Thank you for listening to this battle cry of Paul. And welcome back as we continue reflecting on this great metaphor of the church as the army of God.